Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you are able to visualize this new program carried out in the framework of the participatory group, a community of good practices in terms of public participation and an agreement between the City Council of Madrid and UNED. Today we have two very special guests. To my right, Esther Higueras. How are you, Esther? Good afternoon. And Emilia Roman to my left. Both are professors of the Urban Planning and Territory Management Department of the Architectural Technical Faculty of Madrid. Their research projects are very interesting. They were pioneers. They started in 2015. They started to work on a topic that back then was very rare, which is healthy cities. They are interested in urban design and the shape of healthy cities and the many aspects that make them healthy. So they've carried out a lot of field research and grassroots research because academics do very little of this. That's why we want to invite professors like you. Please tell us a little bit more about the processes and methodologies that you have used and that have so much to do with public participation, the main focus of the participatory group. The first question that comes up for both of you is, what is a healthy city? Thank you very much, Marta, for your invite. Really, a healthy city is a city where people live better. In the same way as we are given recommendations like uh, eat fruit and vegetable, drink a lot of water, do exercise, you should also be told to live in a healthy neighborhood, pollution free with good and vast green spaces and with the promotion of healthy habits, inviting you to go out to the street, to mix with other people in public spaces, to socialize, and that's our line of work. Thank you very much. Now, stemming from this idea, which I find very enriching and enlightening, because often after COVID, we relate health to prevention of pandemics, and it's much more than that. So once we have the right concept of what a healthy city is, what are the general strategies that have to do with what you study, with urban design, what requirements should cities meet to be able to be considered a healthy city? Well, we need to give you a multidisciplinary answer. We are working in extremely complex and interrelated uh, spaces, but within architecture and urban planning, we should build buildings in a different way so that they meet good requirements so that people can live in a more comfortable manner, a healthier manner. From our research group, we are working on urban spaces more than anything. So we have established three basic strategic elements. First of all, creating walkable cities because it's the best way of active mobility, it's sustainable and it helps people remain healthy. Integration of nature within the city, it's proved one million times how many physical and mental benefits green spaces have if they are close to places where people live. And thirdly, spaces to gather and to socialize, especially if they are intergenerational, if there's a mixture of ages there. These are the three basic key elements but they imply many other variables that do enhance the health of a city. Within these three lines of work, have you had the chance to implement them in a real case, in a case study where you have been able to apply these parameters that we all assume as very extremely logic and sensible, but how do they translate to the cities, towns. Have you had the experiences of this sort? Yes, of course. We carry out research with our students at university. We have many graduate and postgraduate subjects about these kinds of activities. We also ask people in the street. It's very realistic. But with regards to your question, we've had two specific activities, one in Spain and one abroad. Uh, Emilia, would you like to tell us about the first one? Yes, of course, we've worked with the Basque government since 2021, trying to implement everything that we have worked in the theory, in the subjects of our university, in several 
neighborhoods in the Basque country, in the three provinces even. So it's been a very enriching experience. We have been working with our citizens. We have approached them in a very meaningful manner. Since we are in UNED, we don't have that much of a direct contact with our students because they study remotely. So I think this is a purely university-based experience because there's research, there's professors involved, but the students are able to see how what they study has tangible results in the real world. What kind of methodologies have you used? It's not easy. It's one thing to create standards and it's very different to apply a methodology to bring these closer to the students that are carrying out the research and the citizens who want to live in a healthy city. Well, obviously, but our methodology has been extremely straightforward. At least that's what we have tried. The straightforwardness of our methodology is reflected in our guide to practice healthy cities, including the three lines of work that Emilia has explained. Our method has been developed through a list of questions because indicators are fantastic. Technicians are used to indicators, but they are often complex and creating a list of indicators requires a lot of effort and time. So we have carried out a, or we have drafted a list of questions that anyone can answer. This approximates us to a quantitative and qualitative diagnosis that any school, neighborhood association or local entity can use to measure how healthy their neighborhood is. Am I meeting all requirements? Am I complying with this? What's missing? There are around 70 questions that are extremely easy to answer to first establish the diagnosis and later develop the plan and solve any priority matters. Sorry for interrupting you, Esther, but in this cross-cutting integration, it's both qualitative and quantitative, we have included big data. The spatial data infrastructure of the Basque government, for instance, and we have also processed data with, with technology that analyzes graphic information. But we have also asked people directly in their neighborhoods, this methodology, this way of approaching our citizens, apart from the focus groups we established with key stakeholders, apart from the surveys carried out, we work our surveys online, but we also find that there's a digital gap that impacts the elderly in these neighborhoods. We have worked on extremely vulnerable neighborhoods and there's an aged population. So instead of digital surveys, we decided to add paper surveys when we wanted to tackle, for instance, elderly homes. We have been able to adapt the methodology depending on the development of the project. This is truly fascinating. Those of you who've been following the experts' workshops and radio programs and dissemination programs of the participatory group will know that we always insist on th this double nature of participation. As Emilia was saying, there are programs that have to do with mass surveys, big data. We have just recorded a radio program about this, but but they don't replace in any way the methodology of approaching people and other means of face-to-face -face participation. What we see here, and I think this dialogue today will fall short uh, because we should invite you to a workshop where you can expand on this topic with images, maps, blueprints, etc. There's a combination. Technology is not the enemy of face-to-face -face participation. Instead, if you create a hybrid model, if you combine both tools, but you know where to implement each, this will be extremely beneficial for the elderly. It's very difficult to answer a survey online. You shouldn't wait for them to find a Wi-Fi connection and be able to open up the survey. No, just go and meet them in a restaurant, make them answer the question before you. Now, what are the results of this process? 
It's extremely complex as an activity. Apart from the dissemination activities, have you published any documents? Can you tell me about the practical or theoretical deliverables or outcomes of the project? Of course, our project has a platform, a website where you can really visualize the outcome so that the citizens will know about the proceeding and the processes related to these actions. Apart from this, we have an advantage now, which is the allocation of European funds for the regeneration of neighborhoods. So one of the three Three neighborhoods that we have worked on, Taramaja, is now developing processes. They are solving their concerns, they are materializing outcomes, and in a matter of years, they will see the results. It's bared fruit. It's the best way to, to measure how successful this project has been. Exactly. Even after the project, we keep participating with our citizens. We have a constant dialogue with the Taramava citizens so that we can adjust tweak the results of the surveys so that we can disseminate the results, not only with academics, but with the whole population. So this project has been participatory from the start, from the diagnosis, the design, to the development of projects. We're talking about cross-cutting, end-to-end participation. How impressive. It's not that easy, even though you're telling it in a very straightforward manner, and that's why you are such good academics and professors. It's very complex to continuously allow for participatory spaces throughout the whole project in a very organized manner and giving the voice and, and listening to the voices of our citizens at each step. Because there are amazing technicians out there, it's very difficult to amalgamate the opinions of experts and technicians with those of citizens. So thank you for giving us a glimpse of how we can create healthy cities, not only from the closed offices in which we work, but going out there, going out to the streets and with an element that Emily has mentioned that is extremely important, which is the intergenerational dimension and the multidisciplinary dimension. Thank you very much. I hope to invite you again to an expert's workshop so that you can tell us more about what you have been doing. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Esther.